you know, yeah, back then it was a massive loss to me, but then it was, now it's what has happened to me and what I'm still going through, which is really difficult because I think people, I get a bit down on myself sometimes when people messaging, you're such an inspiration, da, 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 and I go, oh my God, no. And then you start feeling like you're a fake and a, this false thing because people think that you're just like this really inspiring person that has this mental health condition and that you've been able to overcome it and you live this brilliant life. And it's like, no, like I finished the show and I relapsed. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Matt Brown, and you're listening to the Every L Podcast. Each episode, we'll have a different guest come on and talk about when life hands you an L, is it really a loss or is it something else? Because not every L's a loss. So sit back, relax, or do whatever you guys do to get comfortable as we get into this. Let's go. Welcome everyone to another episode of Every Old Podcast where we have different guests come on and talk about their own experiences in life when things got a little bit challenging. If you think about life in a binary form where things either are a win or a loss, if you stack things up, if you position yourself in the right place and you go to hopefully have that event or that instance work out in your favour but it falls through, in a binary terms that's a loss. And that's what a lot of us encounter in life, but not many of us will share it because it's not something that's Instagram worthy, not TikTok worthy, not social media worthy in general. And that can be quite toxic because it makes us feel alone, that we're the only ones going through this, that or the other. And the reality is everyone's going through their own version of a loss. But in these conversations that we have, we have different people that are going to talk about what they've gone through, what they consider a loss, navigate how they went through these situations, what support they had, and just see if how they feel about it now versus what it was then, if they would still consider it a loss. I have a fantastic individual, and it's cliche to say this because I say it all the time. However, it's my podcast. If I don't think they're fantastic, you're not coming on the podcast. But how do I put it? So I have a lovely lady called Tasha. Not only is she a very comical individual and very, very talented, she's just someone who I appreciate her honesty. I know that I'm very, I get very familiar with people in a very short amount of time. She also does that. And it's just weird how we clicked. I don't know how it felt for her, but for me, it did. And I didn't feel that when I was talking to her that I had to walk, um, step on eggshells or be mindful of what I'm saying because I might be too familiar or anything like that. It was just a it was a vibe. It was just enjoyable. And people like that are really nice to talk to. Not everyone's at that place in their life. And I fully get that. And that's why we have these conversations. But I just enjoyed her warmth, her sense of humor and her openness because through her conversation and being able to divulge what she did, it helped me to have a greater understanding and appreciation for people in that space. So I am extremely gassed to have her on and I am forever going to be fanboy in her I guess and I'm not going to take away from any of her intro intro. she's going to do that herself but just know that I'm grateful for her I'm grateful for all that she's doing the great work she's doing talking about mental health from her own personal experience because there are people out there that would like to talk but through various reasons there is a stigma attached to that but she is being an ambassador she's waving the flag and she's helping to give voices to those that don't have a voice so I thank her for everything she does and everything she's doing what I'm going to ask her to do is come on and briefly introduce herself before we go into our conversation Tasha how are you doing today I'm good thank you mate and then when you said that introduce yourself I was just like oh no (laughs) it's got to be done you're gonna do a better job than I am I'm gonna probably be listening for a whole host of things it's like you know your head worst thing my friend my friend the producer said to me the day he was like you've got to write this bio yourself I was like oh no I don't like talking about like stuff I've done and you wrote a book about yourself no but it's different (laughs) well it's not Talk about yourself in a third person if you need to, if it makes you feel more comfortable. I do that anyway about myself. I call myself Tasha and then she did this and then she Go did Go for that. it. Sometimes, <laughs> it may, it may right. as long as you get the result, it doesn't really make a difference how you arrive there. 
True. Okay. So go ahead. Could you please introduce Tasha, however you see fit? <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't. If I say she, people think I'm talking about Brenda. I'll explain that, obviously, um, in a bit. So, yeah, I'm a mum. I'm a single mum. I always say that first. I think people always say that their careers first and stuff, and they never, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a mum to a, a very bit biased, amazing 12-year-old. Um, I'm an actor. And I suppose, yeah, I, I am. I, and my friends and people probably listen to this and go, she's not going to say it. But yeah, I, and, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I don't like the word writer. Yeah. Been doing it, acting since I was little. And I had a rocky, I've had a rocky road with it. It's not been an easy road with it. And um, I suppose, yeah, class as an author as well, because I wrote a book. Um, yeah. And that basically has been my life, really kind of eat, sleep and breathe it. What is the book called? The book is called Me, Myself and Bipolar Brenda, The Journals of a Happy Soul with a Chaotic Mind. So that was kind of where the writing started for me four years ago. And um, yeah, and the title of the book is about my journey living with, with bipolar disorder. And I'm an ambassador for Bipolar UK. So my work, I think, is very much been surrounded by... It's not the supposed to struggle, but you know, like you say, the like the losses, people, you know, what they take is a loss, but I've, I've I created something from it, from that. Well, that's interesting because a lot of people may not know you because they're not in that space, but yeah. they may not know other people that are also in the space. So I guess it kind of goes back to a conversation we had about invisible disabilities and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And people that have listened to other episodes, they would have known that a few episodes ago, I had a woman on there called Michelle who had free learning disabilities and she made something very poignant. It's talking about how she has the luxury of having an invisible disability where she doesn't have to disclose if she has a disability or not. Yeah. And it can be realistically a blessing and a curse because you can kind of jump between the two worlds. But at the same time, it means it's harder for people to actually believe there's something more than what they can see. And with your condition, it can be hard to sort of say to people, no, this this is normal for me, maybe not for you. I'm not crazy, but there's layers to this. There's, it's not just, you can't just slap one label on it. This is a whole multitude of labels I have to slap on it. But the fact that you're able to lean into this and to be able to create something that other people can witness can hopefully relate to and be able to learn and have a better understanding of other people that are going through a similar disorder I think it's fantastic and I commend you for it I can only imagine it's been a very tough challenge but I don't want to take anything away from what you're going to say because this is your story right so I get what the L's are they want to talk about the, the guest that is and I'm like all right cool let's have a look at it and I paint on mine afterwards now we go on to the interview I look at it and think what are we going to talk about? So what Tash has put first is bipolar. Simple as, just bipolar. I'm going to assume, and she's going to correct me if I'm wrong, she's going to talk about her journey being diagnosed as with a bipolar disorder, um, disorder how it potentially impacts their parenthood. If she doesn't, I'm going to ask the questions around that. And the whole general thing around bipolar. Am I right or am I wrong? Tell me. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's a complex condition, you know. It's um, we're not as far ahead with with bipolar as we are with um, you know, the other invisible disabilities, mental health conditions, neurodiverse. We're we're not as far ahead, and um, yeah, it's 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 a serious mental health condition. It's an illness, a mental health illness, you know, and it's it's a day it's day it can be dangerous if it's not managed, you know, really dangerous. And I've experienced that on both ends of the scale, like the highs and the lows. So, you know, it was, um, it is important for me because when I got diagnosed with it, I didn't know nothing about it. My grandma was a manic depressive. That's what they called it back then. And there was no, nothing out there for me. There was nobody really, because one friend, I had one friend, he's an amazing guy. He's an artist. Um, I always say to him, you need to get on podcasts and he, he, he just won't, he won't do them. Love Arts, I think that's the right name, is on Instagram. 
brilliant creative artist and he actually helped me because he he's got it he, he was great with me but there was nothing out there and it was such a yeah I just didn't know I just I just didn't know who I was and I didn't know why what this thing was and and what it was going to do do to me I was just it was it was really yeah I, I just I, it's when you when I look back now and I think when I, I get asked this question about it I go, oh my God, like, I can't believe how much blinded I was to this thing that I had. And that's what I think fuels me to do what I do because so many people don't understand it and don't know how to help themselves with it. You know, and we don't have, obviously, the resources, as people know, unfortunately, with with the mental health system, with, you know, the NHS do amazing things and the mental health workers are absolutely fantastic, but, you know, we were overstretched. So you need people that can, can you know, Inky Johnson, I told you that I listen to Inky Johnson a lot. And, you know, he says, if you, you're you going to go for adversity, but, you know, when you're going over it, reach your hand out and help the next person. And I think that, you know, that's what, what it should be. So if you can, if you feel you've got, you can stand up, and and talk about your experiences and and not just talk about them when you're coming out of it but you know speaking about it when you're in it which I think is really good for writing writing because you get to write as you are right now and people are reading that that the raw reality of you know shitting yourself because you you, you're having anxiety attacks you know people want to go oh my god like I do that you know that's happened to me and you know I didn't have that there was there was nothing so it it's the best thing in the world what I what taking away all the success of whatever I do with like my shows and stuff like that and I said this when I've done other interviews is is having people turn around and go you've made me feel seen I and and people that from the other side of the world in Canada that read your book and said I never would speak out about what was wrong with me and you've you've made me feel comfortable that I can speak about this and I can go and get help with this. And you kind of go, you know what? I always say it. If you're worthy, I'm worthy of my, if I'm worthy of my, um, I'm worthy of my suffering, it's um, Victor Franklin, A Man's Search for Meaning. He's worthy of his suffering, you know, and you don't go through what you go through if it's not, to be able to help others. I, I truly believe that. And you have to find a reason for why you go through what you go through. What is your why? Why am I going through this? Why have I got that? So many times, why me? You know what I mean? I've been on my knees, like, why me? You know, not being able to pick my child up from school and stay in bed for days and not not being, you know, my friend who's a producer, he he said to me, I never, I got really, he read a bit of something. He said, I was really taken back when he said that he didn't shower for days because I know how much you like to, you know, take care of yourself. And he said the way that you talk about being in physical pain with depression, I didn't know that. So, you know, people, it's not just that kind of being a voice for people that have the condition, but educating people that don't, don't know what people may be going through, you know. And yeah, I think I think that's just been a, I wish I would have had that. I really do. Can I ask, how old was you when you was diagnosed with your bipolar disorder? I think my son was about two. I think I was always like 23, 22, 23. But I was diagnosed with a severe mood disorder when I was 14. I took an overdose the week before my 15th birthday. Don't Didn't know why. Couldn't have said I was sad at the time or everything was just very intense. I was a very intense young teenager. And then it kind of, it's only when you look back and you see all the, you go, okay, I was even at 16. Yeah, that wasn't right. 18, you know, and then obviously, you know, your hormones and you have a child, it can trigger it. And that was, yeah, that was it then. And then it was kind of, I was in the system, back in the system with it. And it's just been, yeah, it, it was a battle at first. It was, it was a massive battle. So what's the difference between bipolar disorder and what was the phrase of mood? Mood disorder. I mean, it's to be honest, I, there probably isn't really because bipolar is a mood disorder. That's what it is. It you know you, your moods aren't regulated. There's part of your brain that doesn't regulate your moods. Like 
no one's saying I'm doing quotation marks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, like a normal brain. What is even a normal brain? But it's it's it's, it's classed as a mental illness. So it's we it's not neuro. We don't come under neurodiverse. Ours is is a, is a mental illness. So it's it's a mood disorder. Your moods, you can't regulate your moods as 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 well. If you look in the DSM five book, it'll give you a scientific. Um, it's um, characterized by severe mood um, swings from high to low to schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia psychosis. But if you speak to anybody that's got bipolar disorder, and I always say. It's not one minute, I think it's a line in my play, actually. One minute you're up, next minute you're down. It's not that. You know, there's so many different things with that you suffer with with bipolar disorder. Yeah, you do get severe lows. I'm type 2 bipolar, so I do suffer with depression episodes a hell of a lot more. And I've had hypermania. Um, and I did suffer, because there was toying around my diagnosis, uh, about 18 months two years ago because I had psychosis I went into psychosis completely lost touch with everything that was going on around me which was a really frightening time because I've never experienced that before but yeah it's different for everybody it's not it's not a one-size-fits-all illness you know somebody stubs your toe and you've got a bruised toe that's it that's it everybody's got a bruised toe there's no difference to how that bruised toe looks or feels it's a bruised toe but with bipolar it, it'll affect me differently to how it'll affect somebody else for sure and what's an example of how it potentially could have impact you <laughs> oh god um i mean the stats are so scary with bipolar because it's um you're 20 percent more likely to take your own life with bipolar disorder Pretty high, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. But I always say, but that must mean I'm eighty percent more likely to live. So this, it's this. I'm ha- percentage is higher to live for me. Um. God, yeah, the lows are bad. It's so interesting you asking me that question because I'm just writing a piece on depression at the moment, and my friend who's a producer, when we have started to restructure the show said about writing the depression piece and he said I think it's going to be the one of the most difficult things that you write and I think that's why you've not written it and he was absolutely right because like I'm getting it in my chest now speaking about it you know it's like, it's horrendous that, that, that for me depression I've suffered with it so severely and because I'm a happy person I'm a happy, happy, positive person, and it takes that from me. Do you know the hypermania for me? I, you know, for me, for other people, it's probably can, I can be quite intense. You know, I don't shut up. I'll be a million miles an hour. I'll be doing one thing. You know, I'll get a lot done, which is you know everybody knows about bipolar. You know, they always say very creative geniuses. I won't class myself as a genius, but I've you know have bipolar disorder. And then obviously like the psychosis for me, that was an experience, but predominantly for me, it's the, I get racing thoughts. Um, and it's it's not daily where it'll affect me or every six months or whatever. I, I kind of suffer every day. There's a lot of things I've done in my life that I have to have in place to keep me, to try and keep me as stable as, as, as I can be, you know. But yeah, answering that question for me, I think that, the depression can be quite because it's kind of always there you know I can just be doing something and then all of a sudden actually doom just comes over me and worry and dread and fear and and then it just I can fall down very quickly with with it I get that and where I've previously suffered intensely with depression as I, I probably still have it but I feel like I manage it a lot a lot better than I did previously. I liken it to the fact of it being a black hole. And my understanding of a black hole, it absorbs everything that's within its reach. So if I'm in a world of depression, no matter how much, how vibrant things are around me in terms of colour, sound, and the joy, 
that is all gone. It's evaporated from around me. I can no longer see colour. I can no longer hear happy, joyful noise. I'm just wallowing because I'm um I'm seeing but I can't necessarily see. Um I can hear something, but I can't distinguish what it is. Oh God, you should write. This is great. Keep going. Take notes. <laughs> Take notes. <laughs> but it's it's all these things that I just I, I just I just understand that I guess if anyone watched like Charlie Brown from back in the day, everyone's like, wah, 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 wah. you can't distinguish anything. Everything is just mushed together and it's not <sighs> it's like a microwave meal. You know, it's not been prepared in separate areas. It's just mushed together and it's like, here, have that, and you just gotta take it. And I'm not getting the nutriment nutrients out of it because it's just leftover scraps. That's how depression made me feel. And I can eloquently explain it now. At the time, I didn't have the desire. I didn't have the willingness. I didn't have anything to to do it. So I kind of get that. And the, I think the heart of this thing about it is I was aware that my mind was telling me this, but I couldn't stop it, if that makes sense. No matter how much my heart may have wanted to do something else, my heart wasn't even in part, in the conversation. It was just my head was in the driving seat yeah and this is how I felt yeah having something like bipolar where your um, disorder where you're unable to regulate your mood so you stump your toe or someone uh, uh, forgive me if I'm being flippant when I say this like someone might cut you off um, driving and that sends you all these things it's, it can I would imagine it can be quite triggering to know that if you don't have the right things in place you could go left instead of right in terms oh, of how your day should go. Yeah. I mean, it, it. every day is different for me and I have to be so mindful when something, you know, stress is not good for, stress is the worst thing if you've got bipolar and I'm in the most stressful industry you could possibly be in. I'm sorry for anybody that's not in this industry and they're like, no, my industry is. <laughs> I am literally in the most stressful industry. I'm in the industry that you get the most rejection. I'm in the industry that makes you question what the hell am I doing? Like, you know, and most p- people that do have bipolar disorder are in creative industries that, you know, they do say that. Um, and my friend, again, he said to me after I did my show, more than anybody I know, you have a burning desire to do what you do, both writing and performing. And without it, you're not complete. And I thought that's so true. But the, the the industry is a really stressful place and stress is just not good for me at all, you know. But then it's like you can't put yourself in stressful situations. You can't be uncomfortable. Then, oh, my God, then what am I going to do? Not do anything. stress is not good horrendous like it can really make me ill and we had to have a really not a difficult conversation with my friend because I'm taking my show to Edinburgh and he actually said to me and at first I didn't know how to take it but he was so right what he was saying and he's you know he's known me since I was 14 it's risky taking you to Edinburgh you know, you're doing show night after night, you know, you're not around people, you know, you know, um, out all day flyering, you know, um, yeah, it could trigger your depression and it might not be good for your hypermania. And we have to have that conversation, but then it was, but do we not take, do it, do I not take the opportunity and go on the off chance Oh, I could get ill from it. You know, anything in life can come at me and make me ill. I'm terrible for worrying about what ifs. And um, I'm terrible for not allowing myself to be happy. I mean, I think we all do that as humans. I've had this conversation with you before about the upper limit. You'll allow yourself to reach a certain amount of success and certain happiness. And then you kind of shrink back down to what you used to because you don't maybe feel you're deserving of that or if you get more success or more happiness then something terrible is going to happen 
so I don't want too much success or too much happiness because if, you know, one of my favourite quotes of all time, Abby Morgan, she writes The Split on BBC One and I harp on about this quote all the time, but it's so true. Life is full of losses and gains and for every gain, you're going to have a loss. You know, it's 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 the way the universe is. Um, it's the way the scales balance themselves out. Yeah. Yeah, and you know how you react to a success really is is how you, you kind of need to train yourself to. Success can be as 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 dangerous for me as what as as what failure can. In fact, I would go as far to say that I deal with failure a lot better than what I do success. Do you know what I actually was going to ask you a question a little while ago, but I wanted to let that land in terms of what you're saying. And when you said about you, stress is not good for you, mm. yet you put yourself there. Yeah. <laughs> Am well, I wrong in saying, and you may not have thought about it, or maybe you have, but are you putting yourself in a space where you get the best out of yourself when things are going good by being in that creative space, mm. but also because you know potentially stress is not good for you, if you can survive and navigate that place that you're at, in theory, that's level 10. Everything else you can deal with because you're already at the worst. Yeah. So everything else, you're good. Whereas if you did a job that, however it is, that even an office job can be stressful because you can get micromanaged and the toxic environment and all sorts, right? But if you're in a job where you thought, this is calm, I can do it, no sweat whatsoever, then all it takes is you to get into a more strenuous situation, but you're not prepped or ready for it because you've always kept yourself at a lower and less stressful environment. Would you say that's potentially why you're doing what you do and you remain there? Oh, I definitely, I think I do work better under pressure. I think a lot of people do that I speak to, to be fair. I don't know, though, I say that. I, I think I put, do you know what? I put my own stress on myself. I put my own pressure onto myself, you know? I, I give myself deadlines. Um, yeah, um, it's a tricky question, you know? that to be fair because I think I do you are your own keeper you know you are in control of you you know we seem people seem to forget that that you know we can keep a control of ourselves you know not that I would do but you know it's up to you what you want to do type of thing you you have that you have a choice life gives you you can choose and I could choose to to sit back and not do anything and just give in to into my anxiety and give in to the not being being quite nervous I don't really like going out on my own I can't go out on my own my son has to come to places with me but I fight not to and I fight to put myself into it you know a producer gave me a quote the other day about why to come and watch my show <laughs> and Deep said she's relentless and in your face and that's why you need to go and see a show it's compulsive um I'm a bit of a fighter I think and I think when you're a fighter if you look at like people like they're totally using this as an example because I'm not I'm not an MMA fighter or a boxer but they they put themselves into those cages they put themselves do you understand where I'm coming from does it make sense yeah they put themselves in that situation I'm putting myself you know I'm walking into the lion's den when I go to Edinburgh I don't know what I'm walking into you know but I'm walking in, you, you know, I could be like, no, I, you know what? I'm not going to put myself in there because that's going to be, that can be, that's probably going to be pretty heated. And that's, you know, I don't know, who's, you know, I don't know. You know, it's that kind of same fighter's mentality if you think about it. Maybe subconsciously it's like, because I don't always have control over my alter ego, you know, Brenda, my bipolar let me control what Tasha's doing and I'm going to go in and I'm going to go toe-to-toe with that. You know, I do have a very toe-to-toe kind of attitude. I do actually want to ask you a question because I did see somewhere where you've named different aspects of your disorder. Yeah. And I'm all right in saying it was to help with your son to identify. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it started out. And then that's what the, the book became about these different characters, I suppose, um, that are part of me, but are not me, you know? Because 
being told that you have a condition, I always used to say, I am bipolar. And it was my Reiki teacher said, no, you're not. And I was like, no, no, I am. And she was like, no, you're Natasha. You have bipolar. It's not who you are. And I think that may be where it all stemmed from, really. And then so it was Brenda, which was bipolar. You know, she's like the main, she's a lead. She's the, she's the starring role. And then you've got the supporting acts, which, you know, are offsprings of her, which is Depressed Debbie, Anxiety Annie, OCD Doris, Manic Mandy. And I have no idea where I got these names from because they're not names that I would actually call any of my characters that I'd write about now. That's probably why you put them there. You're like saying these will never be used. So there you go. You go in the sin bin. <laughs> yeah, that's how I that's how I did it. And it's great, you know, because for kids, well, for my son, Brenda, he really distinguished differently from his mum. And he still does. Not saying it's been easy for him because it has not been easy for my son. What a legend. What an absolute legend. But again, if he'd not gone through what he's gone through and seen what he's seen, I don't know if he would be who he is. You know, he's, he's one of the most caring, considerate little people that I've ever met in my life because he's so, um, he cares about people so much. He cares what other people, how other people feel. And for a 12 year old, that's so I'm very proud of that. You know, and I never say that. I never ever say I'm proud. Obviously, I'm proud of him, but I never ever take any credit. I never do. I always say, oh, it's not me. But actually, as much as, you know, I say you're worthy of your suffering, you're worthy of your success, you're worthy of the downfall, you're worthy of, you know, um, I'm proud that despite what we've gone through and what he's had to go through, that he conducts himself in the way that he does. And I think maybe that is because I did I did not hide it from him. You know, some people might disagree, you know, but I can't, I can't do it because he sees it. And I need to be able to explain to him because me as a mum, as Tasha, you know, he's my best friend. You know, and I I don't I'm not a shouty person, you know, I don't I've never shouted at him ever. One time a couple of years a year ago, I'd lost my drama teacher and I think I turned around and I said something to him. I'd relapsed and I was so disappointed in myself because I thought despite this illness and despite being depressed and out of control, I've never ever shouted at my son, you know? I just think that it helped him because he, he he explains Brenda so well when somebody asks him what's Brenda like and he'll say she's different to my mum. He he uses a Venom example. She's really clever, yeah. So he, he basically says that um, Brenda is like Venom, that she comes to my mum when my mummy feels weak so then she, she she can get a hold of my mum. But if my mum is strong, then Brenda can't. It's like venom. So it means you've got to keep your strength up. Yeah, yeah. Not do anything that could that could trigger me off. Like I can't drink. So that that's the thing. And and obviously with bipolar, you know, you with with it you you quite you can be quite prone to, to self medicating. That's something in my control. It's not in my control. People that have you know, addictions, it's not in your control, you know what I mean? Because if it was, you wouldn't do it because it, it's it's not good for you. And, it, and it's not always in my control, but I, I do have a, a bit of control with that. And it's when I feel weak and I can't cope and I can't, I don't want to go through what I'm feeling, you know, I'll turn to it. But my son doesn't like it and it upsets him and it triggers him and it makes him think back to when I went into mania, you know. And I, that's something that I have to fight so hard with myself sometimes not to drink because I don't want, because I know if I do, then it's going to trigger me even worse. And then that's then going to upset my son. And my son then doesn't have really any, in a way, he feels like I'm letting him down. He doesn't feel like I'm letting him down if I'm, if I'm in a low, 
or if I'm I'm really manic and my, or my anxiety is really bad, he doesn't look at me and think that. With the drinking, he does because he he, he says, but you you could just say or go and see and say I'm, I'm struggling. So yeah, so there's you know I'm very open and honest about it with with what he's had to go through. It's been very very it's been very difficult my condition with him, but I was teaching. Um, a living with bipolar course for Greater Manchester Mental Health. And there was parents coming in there with, with children 16 years old that had been arrested and thrown into a cell. And they're going, they don't have any understanding of it. And I think kids are getting younger and younger and you need to, kids need to be educated on it. Because if the parents are not, you know, if there any if Luke China was ever around anybody, now that suffers he's got such an understanding and the way that we we are now the way the world is is so many more people suffering with mental health so we, the more people we've got that's got an understanding to it and knows how to to, to you know help that people and that that's that's taking a positive that's come out of a negative you know indeed i, I fully agree with that and I think you've done a tremendous job being not just a mum on your own, but being a mum on your own with bipolar disorder, raising a child, making them aware. And the idea of naming each character that makes up this disorder, I think it's a brilliant idea. And I like how he likened it to Venom because it is his, I guess it's an age appropriate way of him identifying with what he's seeing. And that's why it's quite funny because years ago when I was young and living at home my mum, she hated me reading comic books oh, really? because she thought comic books were just rubbish and not anything interesting. But I was like in my X-Men with the different powers they had. But then my, I think someone told my mum or she'd realised that, hang on, you're complaining that he's reading. He was upset that he wasn't reading the books, but he's reading comic books in the stacks. Yeah. I understand words like kinesthetic. I understand about telepathy. So I've learned all these big words because of what these powers that these people have. So then when someone has a condition, you're going to try and relate it because of what, you've been looking at superheroes. So all of a sudden you see them and go, you've got a power and this is what it looks like. And I guess I could say it's a bit like, and I'm really going to show that I'm a bit of a geek here. Have you ever watched Ben 10 before? No. Right, so there's this cartoon called Ben 10. I feel really bad being my grown-ass age, and I'm talking about Ben 10 here on my own podcast. Anyway, I'm going to go with it. Ben 10 is this guy, this boy, he was 10 years old, Found finds this to uh, toy, this alien device where it's strapped to his wrist, so it looks like a watch. He hits it, and it has every different alien in the universe, and he can turn into them. One of them lets him multiply problem is when he multiplies it splits his character in oh, half wow. or eventually if he splits himself too much he's too sets too sensitive he's too brazen he's too whatever and too he's all these different characteristics so in theory someone who has a parent or someone that they're exposed to that has bipolar disorder could potentially identify with oh that's like ben 10's character whatever his name is i like that you'll have to send me that i'll have to have I will do. And I'm not saying whatever his name is because I, I know his name, but I'm trying to prove I don't know his name. I legitimately don't know his character's name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that much into it. But it, it reminded me of that part. And also, there's a woman I know called Natalie Costa. She's a fantastic person who she helps people with children who are going through various challenges and just to support the parent as well as the child. And she's done a great job. And I remember... I think I read it or saw it somewhere where she actually helps children to name their emotions. Yeah. So it so like what your person said to you, like I can't remember what you said then, what their role was, but where they said to you, you are still you, you are Tasha. However, yeah, my Reiki teacher. Yeah. Yes. So you got you 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 detach them from yourself. It's not who I am. It's a part of who I am. But it's not who I am as a whole. So sometimes something might kick off and it's like, oh, you know, what is, when you feel this way, what, what you know, what do, you, what do they look like? Um, what, what's their name? So when yeah. that emotion flares up again, they will say, oh, is so-and-so here? 
And they say yes. And yeah. that's another way of talking about that emotion, but not putting it on that child. That child, yeah. So I, I just love that it's, you know, it's transferable from that level of a, of a person to your level. And I said, hats off to you for being a parent in that environment. Because me as a parent, it's hard. It is. Oh, it's really. Hard. It is hard. There's it's no hard. days off. That you, you can't even take a. You can't take annual leave from being a parent because you need to watch things daily to make sure if there's any changes and what new patterns are forming and making sure everything's on point. Not in an intrusive way, but because you love and care about this individual and you want to make sure that you're present for them. But then to have that go on and you have to try and regulate yourself, watch for triggers. It's sort of like. It's a lot, you know, it's a lot. Are you on any medication at all? Yeah, so I have um, anxiety medication because I have really, really severe, I think the class is general anxiety, but it's chronic, really chronically bad. I get it. Um, and I'm on a mood stabiliser um, that I only went, I, I went back on, med- I was off medication for seven years. Yeah, I started doing, when I, when I got diagnosed with bipolar, I literally went out of my way to do everything I possibly could to try and cure myself, basically. Um, So I went on the spiritual path quite early before anybody was ever posting about meditation and and Reiki and um, yoga and nobody posted about meditation and, and stuff. So I never told anybody that I did it at first. And then I got into powerlifting and that was, it was a key for me, really. I think it, you know, I was always very disciplined anyway because of my drama from, from, from my drama teacher, um, who passed away last year. He was a scary man, <laughs> you know. He really gave you a lot of discipline, not just within in the industry and in your art, but in in your life really. But when I started powerlifting, I think it kind of re relit that in me. Um, because you have to be so disciplined with it. And you have to also, with, with powerlifting, I think what powerlifting did for me, I, I had to really face a lot of fears with it, you know? Being scared of your own mind and scared of your own thoughts is, is one thing, but you're not really thinking about these thoughts when you've got, you know, 90 kilos across your back. Um, so that was a huge turning point in my life, the powerlifting, I don't really train that much anymore. You you know, I don't even really, I've not really been to the gym that much, but I do do a lot of, I do a, a, a type of yoga that not a lot of people are very familiar with. It's called Kundalini Yoga. Um, but yeah, for me, I, um, I, I would say that the gym and, and the powerlifting gave me a lot of, a lot of discipline. And I didn't, my, I was just very fortunate. My trainer was, he eats, sleeps and breathes his job, you know. It's not a job to him. It's it's his life, you know, barring his, his children and his wife. Um, he's just an incredible guy um, and he had a lot of time for me and, and he helped me a lot. And I think if it wasn't for him, I always say this, I do kind of question maybe where, what would have happened because it gave me such a focus and it gave me such a, you know, my diet and everything, it, it massively helps with with this condition. There's no getting away from it. You diet, you 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 your exercise, you you know, you sleep in your routine, and you know you're in a routine when you're training for for competitions. You, you've got to be. So yeah, that was that for me. Kept me off meds for a very long time, a very long time. It's good because it sounds like you had something to focus on, which helps stop the intrusive thoughts coming in and try to run ragged because you're like, yeah, if I don't focus on this. I, I, I'm going to be taken out by these super heavyweights. I love yeah. that. So yeah. looking back, going through what you went through, if it's not an L, what are you calling it? I think it, I'm a great believer in me. Like, obviously, I'm very much into like my spiritual stuff is that you come here and you sign a contract of this is what you're going to sign up to and this is what you're going to do and this is what your soul journey is going to go on. You're going to step into this physical body. And it's difficult to say, but it's like, I agreed to this before I come, you know, um, at the time, you know, 10 years ago, no, it was horrendous. And like a woman came up to me, I think I said it on, on Tom's podcast 
you know, when she came up to me, she said, I felt like my daughter was on a death sentence. She said, and you've given me hope that she can live a good life, you know? Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, sometimes a week, next week, I could be like, I can't live with this illness. Why? This is horrendous. You know, I can't cope. It's, it's, it's killing me. But it's, I think it's given, it's given me a lot of fight. And I've gone through what I've gone through but it's now helping other people. You know, I got a message off a girl today. She's like, do you remember me? Because she read my book. And I was like, yeah, of course I do. And she was like, um, I'm a lot better since last time I spoke to you. And I picked your book up the other day and I just cried when I read the first page. You know, it helped me so much. And it makes you want to keep going. Like what these people don't realise when they message me and they're telling me this stuff about the book and, and the show of what it's done for them. What they don't realise is, is they that those messages. What they're saying to me, they're inspiring me. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, it's um, because I still suffer, and and I suffer. I was I was so I was saying about success can be more can be worse for me than failure because I got a lot of success very very quickly after that book, and I couldn't handle it. It made me ill. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't. I'm a biggest quote ever. I think I'll get it tattooed on me somewhere if I can find any room. Um, it don't let your talent take your places. Your character can't sustain. I like that. Don't let your talent take your places. Your character can't sustain. Inky Johnson. And... Um, and I wasn't ready. My character wasn't ready. I'd not gone through what I needed to go through to build myself. It was like you wouldn't throw somebody into the British Championships if they've gone and done one day in the gym. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, yeah, back then it was a massive loss to me, but then it was now it's what has happened to me and what I'm still going through, which is really difficult because I think people... I get a bit down on myself sometimes when people messaging you, you're such an inspiration, da, 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 and I go, oh my God, no. And then you start feeling like you're a fake and a, this false thing because people think that you're just like this really inspiring person that has this mental health condition and that you've been able to overcome it and you live this brilliant life. And it's like, no, like I finished the show and I relapsed. I wasn't, I knew, and but my friend said to me, he was like, prepare for the bump. And I did, I had things in place. Booked to go back to IB for to do my retreat. Um, had my diet stuff ready. But I tell you what, I'm learning, and it's quite an interesting lesson to learn. You can prepare as much as you want. Does not mean that that wall is not going to still fall down. Like you can build that wall so precisely, brick by brick by brick, everything in order, and just a little bit of wind goes, boom. There's all your prep. And that, and that's what you do, and that's like you know that it happens, and I'm starting to you know, I can't, I can be in control myself and how I react and how I, I do stuff, but I can't control what's out there all the time, you know. So I think, yeah, that was a it was a massive loss for me at the time, but now I'm, I've got a reason why I've got what I've got now. It, it gives me an understanding. So you're gonna say it's un- it gave you understanding, bare insight. Well, I don't think it. I don't think even understanding. I think it's. It, it's, oh God, it's a bit thingy to say. I wouldn't write if I didn't have it. I wouldn't have wrote. Wouldn't have wrote a book. So, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I wouldn't be doing a show. I wouldn't be. So it gave you a livelihood. Yeah. Gave you a livelihood, allowed you to express your passion. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said about life losses and gains, you know. Am I wrong in saying that potentially, and I'm not trying to trivialise this, but it's a bit like a muse for you in terms of it's your inspiration for what you do? Well, yeah, I took it. Well, it was was one of, I had two options, didn't I? That's how I see it. I had two options. I either let it take me. Or I try and build some out of it. That's fantastic. So let me ask you this question then. You said about the no matter how much prep work you could have done beforehand, all the coping mechanisms you put in place, 
it just takes one one little breeze and it could all just fall to pot, right? Mm-hmm. Is that what you tell your younger self when you was going through the thick of it and you felt, nah, I can't do this, this 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 too much? Or would you say something else to your younger self? I don't know what I'd say to my younger self because I feel like I'm still telling her. I've don't I'm 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 obsessed with Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan and stuff. I don't think I've ever I'm still figuring it out. I, I've got a, I've got a TV project called Becoming Better, and I said to my, my friend, oh, I don't think that's the right title because we're we never become better. Because as we become better at one thing, then we need to become better at something else. It's a constant. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's really difficult what I would say to my younger self because I'd have so much to say on so many different areas and aspects. Okay. You know? So if I say then, pick one time from after your son was born when it got really bad for you, when was that time and what would you say to yourself to just push through just to try and give yourself hope that effectively your right now isn't your forever or you're going to find a way to embrace it and make it your own? Oh, my God. How long have you got? Not long. <laughs> I tell everything happens, everything happens for a reason. What's for you is not going to go past you. Yeah? Yeah. Um, obstacles are opportunities. Never, ever, ever ever think rejection is rejection it's not it's redirection that is huge and you never rest but don't ever quit and don't ever let anybody tell you that you you're not good enough and don't let anybody ever tell you that you can't go and achieve what you're going to achieve and yet it might take you a bit longer than other people yeah but don't pay attention to other people's journeys walk on your own path do you know what I mean? Because that's terrible these days. You know, we look at other people, you know, oh, they've got this, they're in that, how have they done that? This isn't fair, blah, 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 blah. Actually, it's just wasted energy, you know? Put that energy into into yourself. And it's the worst, that, like, you know, the worst thing is to compare what other people's paths are and what other people are, are doing. You know, it's um, Jason Mumford says it so well in one of his shows. He says, don't compare your film to somebody else's trailer. Very true. There is also a phrase that says, comparison is a thief of all joy. And if you also think about it, and this is something I like, it says, Colonel, the things that popcorn are made from, they all go into pan at the same temperature, but it all pop at different times. And some don't pop at all. Yeah. Or why do we not look at ourselves in the same way and think, just because you've popped, don't mean I'm not going to pop. And if I'm not going to pop, so be it. But there's still a chance. While the fire's going and I'm still here, there's still a chance for me popping. Yes. Like that. While the fire's there, I'm still popping. Yeah. So like do you think, because I'm conscious that a lot of that was quotes, so to speak. Like, don't get me wrong. I love myself an analogy and I'm I from like, all day, every day go through my catalogue of podcasts and you'll hear me throw that analogies left, right and centre. And even when we had our chat, we've had it. But do you think at whatever stage it was where you was at your worst that you was thinking of, do you think that version of Tasha would have heard you reel off those very poignant and very accurate quotes and go, yeah, I'm going to take that on board? Or do you think... Oh my god, no, she would have been like, Yeah, she would have just been like, What a dickhead! So, what do you, this version of Tasha, have to say for that younger version of Tasha to accept or to hear what you're trying to say to yourself? How would I get her to listen? Yeah, I'd probably just after school drag her, wouldn't I? No, I'm joking. If that's what has to happen, then. <laughs> yeah. so, I don't know. I think I'd probably tell her just to just take a minute. Do you know what I mean? Just take, just, just take a step back. Just pause for a second. That's probably what I'd say. Just, just listen for a minute, because she didn't. And so, listening to what advice and help was to people that was trying to support you, or 
she just didn't what she did it's funny saying what she did because I talk about the character and I say she and then it's like no me she um what my younger self did she wasted a lot of time around the wrong people I probably would say shorten the time around who you're associating with and you think just by having a conversation the younger version of yourself would have heard that and received it and acted accordingly no I don't think my younger version would would have listened to me because she's stubborn and she she didn't the younger version of me only started to want to to get better and to better herself after she had a son so do you think that so okay this time you're thinking about where you was at your worst what was you doing what was the, what was the thing that was bad for you i think when i was that that when i was 15 okay so yeah. if you're talking to the 15 year old version of yourself do you think talking to her and saying there's going to be things in the life you're going to want one of them may be a child and if you do have a child you're going to love him with all your heart you're going to want to be there for him you're going to want to protect him from everything and the only way you're able to do that is by putting certain things in place that's going to help you get better and manage this better but the people you're hanging around they're not fueling that fire they're setting you on fire yeah and they're not going to allow you to have the life that you're capable of having or something of that not trying to say that's what you would say but do you think it'd be where you'd have to explain to her that right now you can't see it but there's a life ahead of you that you're going to step that you can potentially have but you're not going to be able to sustain it because like you mentioned about the quote you might have talents to get you somewhere but your character can't sustain it so are, they, are your are your friends in quotation mark taking you one way when in reality you need to go the right way for you yeah exactly that that was a that, very accurate what you just said I've, I've got into that phase at my life with my life at the moment where I just think everything happens and everything that has happened has supposed to do you know what I mean if anything would have gone a different I said this today actually if anything would have gone slightly even tiny if a butterfly would have flapped its wings a completely tiny slight different way anything would have gone different up to where I'm at right now with what I'm doing I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing I wouldn't be doing it fair enough appreciate the honesty there and I guess it's it is hard to sort of answer that question realistically because we don't know if truly would hear ourselves but I'd like to think us being the age that we are now, far away, removed from what we was younger, we would probably have a better understanding and be able to just have that conversation and say, right, I think I would need to say this way because you knew when you started listening versus when you wouldn't listen because if it else was boring or wasn't interesting to you. But now you're like, I would have to hear it that way. And I, I just love that question. And I'm just, I appreciate you sharing that. For me, I, I enjoy the question. I'm always interested to hear what people would say because I know yeah I'm definitely a different person now to what I was when I was younger yeah everybody you do you are though don't you when you look back and also I think that's the thing isn't it you can't you you wish so much that you could be how you are now 10 years ago yeah I'd I'd actually love to be I'd want I'd love to be like that but if I would have been would I would have molded into this I can't get couldn't have got to this without have been been there could I exactly that and I think that's why I enjoy the conversations because it helps us to not focus too much on the destination where we're trying to reach, but appreciate the journey. Yeah. Because without the journey, we wouldn't be able to tell the stories or to make the connections, to have the empathy, to 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 manifest and articulate ourselves into the person that we are at this present moment because we've gone through those hardships. How many times have you had a conversation with people that have not been in your industry and trying to blag it? And it's like you haven't been in my industry, so you're trying to understand what I'm talking about, but you're not there. But when someone has gone through what you've gone through, you've overlapped for even a season or whatever it is, you just get it. It's like you understand what I'm talking about because you've been there. Yeah. And I I don't know. I just think it's really important that we don't disregard where we're coming from. We don't look back in anger at everything that potentially was not the way we wanted it to go. And if we can see a benefit to it, hopefully that'll help us with our mind, uh, mindset now in terms of just because there's a 20% chance that I might do this, 
there's an 80% chance that I might do something else. Yeah. It's how you see things and hopefully we'll be able to live a more richer and more fulfilled life because we're able to change our mindset, which is not too dissimilar to adding a, a Snapchat filter to your life because you can add a filter to your pictures and whatnot, but you can't change your life like that. But if you change your mindset, all of a sudden, everything's better. Just like that phrase that I really don't like where it says, bad things happen in freeze. And the reason I don't like that phrase is because it's true. People find that. People go for it. It's like, well, this happened and that happened and that happened. They're right. Bad things happen in free. Mm. No, the only reason you found the free is because you're looking for them. If you said good things happen in free, guess what? You'd find all three of them, yeah. but you don't look at them that way. And that's the part where I just, I want people to have a more positive outlook. I'm not saying detach yourself from reality and act like everything's hunky dory when it's really not, but just take control of whatever you can. Because one of my phrases I do like is that you can't stop a wave, but you can learn to surf. Yeah, definitely. And it's all about what you can do. And it's all about your reactions. It can be exhausting. It can be frustrating. And like you eloquently put, all the stuff you've done, that you know, the deadlifting, the taking the medication, putting certain things in place to make sure that you are okay as much as you can and making sure that, as your son put it, venom doesn't manifest himself and take over and you have bipolar Brenda up here. Yeah. You're doing what you can. Sometimes things will just go left instead of right. It is what it is. But yeah. you're doing what you can to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I commend you for that. And I'm so upset that we don't have enough time to go into your second L. Maybe I might have to borrow you another time. We can talk about that. The reason I put that down was because that loss has actually become my biggest win. <laughs> Oh, we're definitely getting you back on here then. That, that, that's, that's... When I read it, I thought, oh my God, that's mad because I didn't like get the quest, like looking at reading the quest. And I thought, oh my God, that's so interesting because I always say that was the worst loss, one of the worst losses you could have ever took. And it's now my biggest win. Like... Definitely getting you back on. So what I'm going to say, um, do for the next two minutes, can you please promote anything and everything you got on this is your time to shine plug yourself for the next two minutes go for it um so my one woman show is going to the hope street theater in liverpool on the 12th of july and the 15th of july for its edinburgh preview um shows and then i'm in edinburgh at the edinburgh fringe at the space annex from the 21st to the 26th of august and I think my slot times nine ten till ten ten, and that's on my social media. On um, I can't remember my Instagram name then. Little Tasha Lucci or me myself and Bipolar Brenda. Yeah, two Instagrams. So yeah, that's mainly I suppose my plug really is mainly yeah come and come and get on the Bipolar Express and um, yeah watch the show if you're in Liverpool or if you if you're up at the Fringe. And all the details will be in the show notes, folks. So. Thank you very much to the wonderful Tasha for sharing all that she did. It it was very interesting, very insightful to speak to someone so so much about what you've gone through. And I know we barely even scratched the surface because you couldn't really touch on everything in that short amount of time. But I think we covered quite a lot of ground. And I think if anyone wants to know a bit more about you, then feel free to go buy her book, go buy tickets and go see her one woman show and reach out to her she's lovely she's absolutely amazing and we are going to get on for part two i'm going to bug her so the show's a bit sloppy i apologize because i bugged her so much for part two but it was worth it it would be worth it because i want to know about this biggest loss that she had yeah i know i, I just i just did a dun dunny stenders drop there didn't i you did <laughs> I did a Danny Fire drop. Do you know what? I feel like I'm going to have to put in the, in- the outro music. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> We're done. Yeah, I'm going. I think I'm on one at the minute about getting these these um these these endings where it's making people want to come back for more, yeah? Yeah, these cliffhangers. That's it. I, I, hands down, I swear to God. like It was literally the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm and, not uh, doubting that. It's meant to say that, though, isn't it? Like, it is. It is. And I think it's even better that you can actually recognise that. Yeah. Because some people wouldn't. Some people will just not look back in the way that it actually is. So I, I'm so excited to hear about that. 
so yeah, everyone, thank you very much. I hope you join me in just thanking Tash for being so open about a condition that many people wouldn't necessarily be open enough to talk about because there is a stigma associated with when people are not considered okay in quotation marks because they might think they're not capable or they're brittle or they're less of a person when the reality is no they're still able to function in some capacity you just have to maybe make an allowance here or there for them just because they need to make sure they're okay to still perform at the level they need to perform their daily tasks so anyone everyone out there who may suffer with bipolar disorder or know someone that has please just Hopefully this opens your eyes a little bit more to what they've gone through or what they're going through. And hopefully I'll help you to have a better, more meaningful conversation about what they're going through, how to help encourage them in the right way and not necessarily put them in situations that may be too stressful for them just because they want to make you happy. But I just want you, if you've got any questions or queries, just reach out to Tasha. She may not be able to answer your question straight away, but I'm sure she'll get back to you at some point or point in the right directions. She is a wonderful human being. Go check out her show. And yeah, anyone that wants to, obviously you can reach out to me. I'm on Instagram mainly, which is every L podcast on Twitter as well. Same handle. And yeah, I, to be honest, right, I actually put trailers out on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and all sorts. So if you want to check the trailers out, go find them there. But I'm really happy and I'm really grateful for having Tasha on and I hope everyone learns that just because sometimes you have something that makes you different from other people, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to ruin you or it has ruined you. Sometimes you just have to be a bit different because you're born to stand out and you're born to help pave the way for another wave of people to come through. Your your experiences is potentially someone else's roadmap. So embrace it, pay it forward, and just know that if your purpose in life is to be a bridge, be a bridge and hold it and be firm about it just so no one has any doubts because they're scared already. But don't let them be scared of the journey as well as the fact that you may not be able to hold the weight. Just firm it, let them walk across you and know that they've got this because you have got this. Thank you. I'll see you guys in the next episode and enjoy.